maybe a year and a half ago, uh, Megan and I were at a movie, and it was a film called uh, Cowboys and Aliens. We watched about an hour of this movie, and it was truly awful. It was like a cinematic cat catastrophe. And uh, at the end of the movie, everyone is sitting there, I, th I think stunned, just not knowing what to do. And so I start the slow clap. And, and all of a sudden, you like, everyone starts clapping. And like, no one could possibly think this was a good movie. I, you know, but, but they're clapping and they're like, I'm sure that afterwards they're like, why was I clapping for that? So that to me was, was an unconscious decision. Now, there's been a lot of research about our behavior and the cognitive process and emotional processing, but the relationship about what's actually happening with our neural system as we do that, what causes us to do that, is, is a little bit less uh, explored. And we have found the perfect person to explain to me why people actually clap for that movie. Uh, and also to explain to the rest of us what happens in the process of our unconscious decision making and how it controls our behavior and how it controls how we see things. So I'm gonna bring up Heather Berlin. Thank you. Um, so a personal story about why I got into this and why I'm interested in understanding the neural base of, basis of not only consciousness but of our unconscious processes is I was five years old, I was in bed one night, I couldn't sleep all night, I woke up the next day, well I didn't sleep, I, the next morning I said to my father, um, Dad, where do my thoughts come from and how can I keep them when I die? And <laughs> He said, well, they come from your brain. And I said, okay, great. So how and how can I keep them? And he didn't really have an answer for me. And this became my burning question. I wanted to understand how does my brain make my thoughts? How does it make my feelings, emotions, awareness, everything I experience in the morning from the second I wake up till I go back to sleep into a deep dreamless sleep, all these things, how does our brain create this, our perceptions? And I wasn't the only one. I mean, of course, there was Descartes. He thought about this as well. And his answer was they come together in the penal glands. So our metaphysical soul, he called it the seat of the soul, comes together, meets with our brain with, in the penal glands. He wasn't right, but he was starting to think about this. Then, of course, there was uh, Sigmund Freud, and he came up with this grand theory of the minds, right? There's these conscious processes, but they're being motivated by all these deep, dark, unconscious processes. And he thought that they were instantiated somehow in the brain, but at the time, he didn't have the tools to understand how. So he made this little sketch up here, um, what he thought was the neural basis of repression. Um, he was starting to try to think about that. But now, in the last, let's say, about 20 to 30 years, we're starting to develop the technology that will allow us to sort of peer into the brain and understand where all these unconscious desires are coming from that are really motivating our behaviors. So, some of the things that we can use in the lab are these types of stimuli, which are Stimuli that are presented either in a sort of a degraded form, a subtle form, or presented really quickly so that people don't claim that they're consciously aware of perceiving the stimuli, yet it goes on to affect their behavior. So for an example here, there is a subliminal message here. Once you see it, which is interesting, you can never not see it. So this is the interesting thing here. It's coming in, it's being processed by your, your eyes, it's being pro processed by the visual part of your brain, um, but you're not perceiving it. Now I'm gonna point it out to you. In the negative space, you can see, I don't have a pointer, but it says S-E-X. Can you see it in the negative space, sort of down by the roots of the flowers? You see? No. Now you see it. And there's also sort of the birds and the bees and the flowers are kind of gesticulating towards each other in a kind of loving way. So now something changed in your brain. The same image was there before, before you didn't see it, but now you do. And once you do see it, you can never unsee it. And the question is, what changed in your brain? Because the stimuli coming in stayed the same, but something inside your brain changed. And that's what we want to understand, what that is. The other types of experiments which use images, for example, in an experiment done by Tony Marcel in England, he presented either a picture of the boy throwing the cake, the bad boy, or the good boy presenting the cake, but he presented it subliminally, in a very quickly, outside of awareness. And then he presented the picture of the neutral boy and asked people to describe that boy. And, of course, if they saw the boy with throwing the cake, the bad boy, 
unconsciously, subliminally, they would describe the neutral image with more negative properties versus if they saw the good boy, they would describe it with more positive qualities. And it's not only that, there's also olfaction. Smell can affect your behavior. So there's studies that show that if you put a clean scent into a room while someone's doing an experiment, you give them a cookie as a reward at the end, they're more likely to clean up their crumbs if they're in the room with a clean scent in the air. Um, People who are doing a competition task and they see a briefcase somewhere in the distance are more likely to act more competitively. Also, it's semantically, we can, you, people are affected unconsciously. In this experiment, they showed subliminally different words, either say the word bread or truck, and then superliminally, consciously, they would show a word and they would say to the person, just say is it a word or not? So either they'd be presented with a word or a nonsense word and just say if it's a word or not. What they found is that they were quicker to say that, let's say, the word sandwich was a word if they were presented with the word bread subliminally. And what's interesting here is it's not just the way the, the word bread looks or how it sounds, but it's the meaning of the word bread. Bread goes with sandwich. So it's not a dumb unconscious. We're processing things at a very deep level. The final thing that I wanted to talk about is this sort of more of psychoanalytic Freudian unconscious, right? Things like suppression, repression, dissociation. Uh, suppression is when we push thoughts outside of awareness. You know, let's say you have a fight with your significant other and you need to go to work and you can't think about it, so you say, I'm not gonna think about it right now. We push it away. Repression happens when this happens outside of awareness. So some traumatic experience or memory and the brain pushes it outside of consciousness without you having to do it. And then finally, dissociation. Dissociation is, have you ever heard of multiple personality disorder? You know, people split off into these different conscious states where they have access to memories in one state but not in the other. Repression is a little bit harder to get at because repression happens outside of awareness. We can use this sort of experimental paradigm here where you present an image to one eye, let's say an angry face, and then a flashing Mondrian image to the other eye. And the flashing Mondrian image is so salient that it supersedes the angry face. So all the person claims to perceive is the flashing Mondrian image. And with this technique, you can sort of start to probe people's unconscious because you can present them things that they say they're not conscious of seeing. And in this one experiment, that's exactly what they did. They presented them here using this continuous flash suppression technique with either a naked man or a naked woman image. But it was covered up by this flashing Mondrian image, so all they claimed to see was the flashing colors. And then afterwards, they would test the people to see where they were unconsciously paying attention, what part of their visual field. And they did this by presenting a gradient that was either tilted to the left or the right slightly. And they would say to them, just which direction is this gradient tilted? And they would time them, how long it took them. Now, if they were already pre-attending, let's say, to the left side of the visual field, they'll be quicker to say what direction that gradient was facing. So this is a way to measure unconscious attention. And what they found was when they gave this test to both heterosexual men and women and also homosexual men, first with heterosexual men, which is the top one there, they found that they paid significantly more attention, unconsciously that is, to the area of space where the naked woman was presented. Now remember, they didn't consciously see this naked woman, it was, it was covered up by this flashing image, but they were already attending to that visual space. And women were attending to the space unconsciously where there was a naked man. What was also interesting is that homosexual men acted as heterosexual women did, and they unconsciously attended to the naked men. But the reason I bring up this study, because I think it's a, a great way to look at re repression, because the interesting finding is up on top, if you see that sort of bar at the end, the black bar that's going downward, heterosexual men actually diverted their attention from naked men. So in a way they were avoiding, unconsciously, the image of the naked man, in a way repressing, let's say Freud would say, you know, their homosexual desires. And you didn't get that effect with women. So it's a kind of tricky way, but an interesting way to start getting at what's going on with this idea of repression and how can we measure it in the lab. The final thing I want to talk about, uh, which I think is really interesting, is this idea of dissociation. So you've all heard of you know, multiple personality disorder. Nowadays it's called dissociative identity disorder. And it's where people have usually have had a traumatic experience and they kind of split off and in one conscious state they claim to have the memory of that experience, and another, sort of the neutral identity state, they claim no recollection of that experience. But not only that, within these two different states, they have different uh, 
EEG responses, brain responses to images. They have different cardiovascular uh, responses. In some cases, in one case, one woman claims to be blind in one state and could see in the other. And when they actually did an EEG, which measured the sort of activity in the part of the brain that has to do with visual perception, when she was in the blind state, she would not get a response in the part of the brain that has to do with processing visual images. So in a way, she was really blind in that state, which is almost impossible if you think about keeping your eyes open and trying not to see. It's, it's almost impossible to do, but she somehow, there's a mechanism that allowed her to do that. So you can do incredible things in these two different states. And this is just showing here, I mean, it's, it's a bit complicated, but the point here is to say that within the two states, they would present them these, these memories, and when they were in the state that they claimed they had access to the memories, they'd have increased heart rate, increased emotional activation. Um, but when they were in the neutral state, they were flat line. That's the dotted line there. So there's a real separation. So the final point here is, okay, what's going on in the neural basis? How is this happening? Um, <clears throat> we know that it's not necessarily a difference between activation of different areas, but there might be a problem with the connectivity between different brain areas that's allowing people to act in these different, uh, have these different states of consciousness. And we know that integration of different parts of the brain, cortical to subcortical, basically the white matter that, that connects these different parts of the brain, we know that, that passing information between these different areas is necessary for consciousness. And if you mess with that, you're gonna get these, these changes in conscious experience. And we know that it might be NM, NMDA mediated because the drug ketamine um, is an NMDA antagonist, and people can have dissociative experiences when they're on this drug. So there's certainly something to do with the connectivity um, and how that relates to our conscious experience. And now we can use techniques like called diffusion tensor imaging, which actually can measure the connectivity, look at the white matter in our brain, and see if it's degraded, for example, in people with dissociative identity disorder. So I think the big questions that are still left to answer and that we're still exploring are, how do unconscious thoughts sort of bubble up and come into consciousness? You know, when we have Freudian slips, what's the neural mechanism of that? And also, what's the neural mechanism of when we suppress things, when we push things outside of consciousness and keep them there, and how they still continue to affect our behavior? Also, what's willpower, free will? You know, how can we control our impulses? How can we stop smoking, stop drinking, stop doing things, you know, go on a diet? What, who's controlling what? Is it one part of the brain controlling the other? And how can we enhance this sort of so-called willpower? Another big question is psychoanalysis. How does that work on the neural level? We know it works, but how? And finally, ultimately, we really need a theory of consciousness. And people are starting to theorize about this now. Someone named Giulio Cinoni has come up with an um, integrated information theory of consciousness, which he calls phi, which is very complicated, but you can look it up. And he wrote a great book, um, I think, on the subject now. So these are the big questions. We still haven't found the answers, but we're starting to use the technology that we have to start to answer the questions that people like Descartes asked, and Freud asked, and you know, a little five-year-old girl asked in New York one day. So Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah.